Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another live edition of Wealth Building Wednesday. Wealth Building Wednesday is a broadcast that comes to you live on Facebook and YouTube every single Wednesday, 10 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time. And we re-air the audio of this awesome show every Wednesday, 1.30 p.m. on our media partner, WBFZ Z105.3. My name is Lydia Chapman. I serve as the director of TRHT Selma, and I am delighted as always to have a phenomenal guest join us for today's show. Y'all, Well Building Wednesday, we focus on making sure that we put the information where you, the community, can connect with resources that can help you build wealth. We understand that there's this thing called a wealth gap in our country, where for every $100,000 of wealth that some people, some families may have, Black folks and other marginalized communities have not always had access to that. So there may be, um, whereas some folks have 100,000, there are Black families that are struggling to get 100, right? hundred dollars in wealth. So we want to make sure that we are um, leveling the playing field, if you will, with Wealth Building Wednesday. And this is just a part of what TRHT Selma does to improve outcomes for folks all across our community. So this show here today, listen, I am so delighted. She is um, the hardest working, one of the hardest working women I know. <laughs> has taken a moment out to share some great information with us. Welcome, Tanya S. Chestnut, Dr. Chestnut. Um, she is a realtor. She is a professional. She is, man, she is a woman of her word, of the word and of her word. So want to say welcome and good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time out to have this important conversation today, y'all who have tuned in. Dr. Chestnut is here with me today to talk about home ownership. Um, again, I talked in the intro about this thing called a wealth gap. Did you know that Black people, Black families, literally have less ownership when it comes to land than we did coming out of slavery? During early Reconstruction, there were more Black people who owned land than currently do in 2022. And so we've got to turn the tide on that. And so I wanted to, the very first question that I have for you, Dr. Chestnut, is why are land and home ownership so important? Well, when you look at uh, statistics and you look at what uh, a lot of your uh, real estate uh I'm having a senior moment. Hey, a lot of what you see as far as millionaires or those that have obtained wealth, mm -hmm. there's a commonality among majority of your wealthy people, and that is real estate ownership. And that real estate ownership is not just in the home that they live in, but in purchasing and investing in real estate property to establish passive income. And so that's one thing that we really, really need to focus on is that being intentional in making sure that you are an investor. During this time, we have to have multiple streams of income. Yes. And real estate is one stream of income that uh, is attainable to most people. And so I think a lot of times people may feel like they don't have enough money or they don't have the resources, but it is available. You just have to be intentional and plan to accomplish that goal. Listen, now you brought up two uh, terms, intentional being one of them and, and making sure that we're creating multiple streams of income to create passive income. So for those of us who may not understand the difference between active and passive income, our jobs are active income, correct? Correct. But passive income, what, what is meant by the term passive income? When I think of passive income, I think of ways that you can make money that does not require you a continuous and consistent time. Uh, you are allowing your investment to make money for you. And so uh, real estate is one form of passive income. Absolutely. So now when it comes to um, real estate and, and, and knowing the difference, because some of us um, have lived as renters, um, for the majority of our lives. 
Um, and now if we're just now recognizing that real estate really is a, a real investment, right? You are you are gathering a real estate, like a, a piece of the land. You know, land, there's only a, a finite amount of it. There's not, you can't just go out into the ocean and just right. create more <laughs> land. <laughs> so now for those of us who may be considering transitioning from being a renter to a homeowner, what are the differences um, that we we should prepare for um, when you consider the difference in between the lifestyle of a renter versus a homeowner? What are the things that we should prepare for? Well, when you consider a renter, to be honest, a renter is one that is paying for someone else's property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but you can easily make that transition. Now, it may require a change of financial practices. Okay. You know, I found that it's not in so much how much money you make, but what you do with the money that you do have. Mm. And so uh, I would encourage anyone that's uh, planning to transition from being a renter to a homeowner to begin by making a budget, really looking okay. at your finances and I always say, I tell my kids to put a name to your money because you really don't realize how much money you throw away uh, when you don't have it uh, earmarked for a certain purpose, even if that purpose is for uh, entertainment or for some of the things that you like, but at least have uh, spend your money intentionally. But then also really pay attention to uh, how much you charge as far as credit. You know, uh, only charge for necessities. Oftentimes we, we have uh, a habit of just charging because we want to, you know. And so uh, when you're getting ready to prepare to make a purchase, uh, there are several things that, they, that are considered. And that is how much debt you have compared to your income. And so you want to keep your debt to uh, uh, credit ratio low but then set financial goals. You know, one thing about saving money, if you put aside consistently, uh, that money will accumulate. And I think a lot of times people think that you just got to have a surplus of money to begin the saving process. But set financial goals and recognize that everyone can be a homeowner if you have a steady income, if you have a uh, reasonable amount of credit and you have um, don't have a whole lot of uh, revolving debt, uh, then you are definitely uh, in route to becoming a homeowner. So now there were there were quite a few nuggets that you just dropped there. So I want folks to make sure that they're capturing the information that you're sharing. One of the first things that you asked us to do is to make sure that we assign a name to every dollar that we earn, that anything that's coming in, give it a name. So having that budget, having that spending plan allows us to do that. But then to also make sure that we start saving, being very intentional at any amount to set something aside and that really goes back to the one of the very first things you said when we began the conversation is making sure that we're creating good habits. Yes. Right? Yeah. So now what are some of the very first things? So now we've decided, OK, we're going to transition from from being a renter into a homeowner. You talked about some of the um, the things that we need to do, but you brought up this this C word, this credit. <laughs> Now, we've talked about um, credit quite a bit on Wealth Building Wednesday because it really is something that is truly important in our society. So I mm -hmm. want to ask you why our credit scores are so important when it comes to home ownership. What difference does a credit score make? Oh, the credit score makes all the difference. And so, you know, I would encourage anyone to uh, obtain a copy of your credit report. Okay. Uh, and you can do that with freecreditscore.com. There are so many. You just Google free credit uh, report. You will find various options where you can obtain it. But you also want to be uh, sure that what's on your credit report is correct. Uh, sometimes there are errors that may be on there. And then uh, look at areas where you can improve. One thing about the credit report, it will definitely give you a visual picture of where you are 
uh, spending your money or where you're charging, you know, how can you minimize your uh, revolving debt? Do you have a lot of credit cards from different stores? Uh, just what are you, what are you charging? And I encourage anyone, and I really stress this to my own children, you know, um, credit cards are not for you to buy what you can't afford. It's not for you to use uh, just because it's there and available. And so we just want to encourage you to keep your um, credit uh, charges down. However, it can serve as a twofold purpose because if you don't have credit, that is a way to build credit. And you can do that by getting a secured, secured credit card. You can go okay. to your bank and get a secured credit card. Now with that, you use your own money. For instance, mm -hmm. you may put down $250 or $500. And so as you use that card, you're actually using your own money. But the beauty of it is to make sure that you build a history of good payment, meaning paying on time. And if at all possible, if your uh, credit limit, whether it's a secured credit card or one that is not secured, try to keep your, your balance at least below half of your limit. Because you, when you max out, when I say max out, it means that if, if they've given you a $1,000 uh, credit limit or a $5,000 credit limit and your balance is $4,900, then you're pretty much maxed out. And even though you're paying on time, it does not work to your advantage. And so I encourage you uh, to keep your balance at least below below half. And then use it if you can. If you're going to use the credit card to build credit, be prepared to go on and pay it off. Mm -hmm. You know, so I may use my card because I'm trying to establish credit. But I also know that this is money that I would have spent uh, in cash or with a debit card. So I am in position to now just go on and pay it off. You can go on and pay it like the next week or so and build a great positive uh, history of, of payment. So now you have said quite a bit now, um, and, and I just want to encourage those folks who have been tuning into Wealth Building Wednesday for a while. Think back on how many people are saying the exact same thing. You have Dr. Chestnut telling you today as you prepare um, to become a homeowner, you have um, Ms. Hesley, who is with Lifelines Counseling, who is a credit counselor. We have folks from Hope Credit Union that have come on, Mary Ann um, Givens, who's come on. These ladies are saying the exact same thing. So it must be something to it, right? Mm -hmm. And how to manage this thing called credit. Those nine digits that we are assigned at birth, that social security number is there. Those are the nine digits that America uses to identify who we are and what we do, because that's exactly how people, you know, are able to pull your credit using you. Have, that's why you have to enter your social security number for things like student loans or when you're applying for a job. Right. Because there are many jobs that require um, credit checks now. Mm -hmm. um, even if you are looking to be a renter, there are apartment complexes that simply right. will not let you in depending on your, what your credit score is because that is their way of observing what your habits are. And just as Dr. Chestnut just said, y'all, your credit report tells you how you're spending your money. And if we're not using our credit wisely, if we're not using those um, those guaranteed cards, those secured credit cards to build credit, right? So that the bank now says, okay, you have an unsecured credit card. So now that you you have been, we we see, we notice that in our relationship with you that you're doing well, we want to extend you more credit, but we've got to do right by that. So I want to ask you though about this, and you've mentioned it before um, in, in our conversation, debt to income. Like what difference does our debt to income ratio make when we are thinking about this home buying process? Well, when uh, lenders are looking at your um, income, they're also looking at how much debt you have. And of okay. course, they're looking from a vested interest that you have the ability to pay. Okay. And so you can't have the majority of your income already spent prior to obtaining a loan for a home. And so 
like I said, you want to make sure that your debt to income ratio is as low as it can be so that uh, you can show that you are, first of all, someone that they are not considered high risk, you know, because with life, things happen that we don't expect. And so you can't spend, of course, more than you make. Uh, and that's, that's something because you don't want to go. You want to keep your home when you get it. Right. You don't want to go into foreclosure. And I understand sometimes things happen that we have no control over. But uh, as they even with a great credit score, you can't be so head over heels in debt that if something does appear, you're not able to maintain your mortgage payment. OK. And so that's important for us to know um, debt to income. We want to monitor our own debt to income, whether a mortgage lender is monitoring that or not. Right. So if you know you are bringing in five thousand a month, but you're spending seven thousand because you depending on these credit cards. Listen, we, we got some. the math is not mathing. OK, we, right. we we've got to correct that and make sure that we get in alignment with living within our means and making sure that um, we appear to be a dependable um, person when it comes to seeking these home these home loans. So now what about apps? Because as folks start to, to, to position themselves, right? If we're positioning ourselves to become a homeowner, we have gotten our debt to income ratio um, to within a, a really good range. Um, we have gotten our credit score way up there so that we can qualify for as many loan products as possible at low, lower interest rates, which is really important right now as interest rates continue to, to rise. Um, how can apps like, or are they even helpful, apps like um, Zillow and Realtor? I know that as a real estate agent, as a realtor yourself, um, you probably get calls from folks who've seen stuff. <laughs> Online. So how can these apps help um, or do they help at all with people who are looking to become home? Oh, yes, exactly. They do help. You know, I encourage anyone if you're uh, actively seeking to obtain ownership of a home, uh, hire a real estate agent. And the beauty mm. of uh, buying a home, when you are the purchaser, it costs you nothing to have a real estate agent working on your behalf. And so um, get someone, uh, Zillow, of course, uh, there are several different um, uh, online options for um, looking at homes and what's available. It's like a system that's been developed so that you can see what's, a, what's out there and what's for sale. But at the end of the day, you still need to hire a real estate agent. Now, some of those companies can and will assign you someone, but if you know someone that you trust, you can easily go onto that site and say, hey, I saw this property at this location or the MLS number, and they can uh, work specifically on your behalf, someone that you know and someone that you have chosen for yourself. You know, that would be your first step. And then after you've hired a real estate agent, the next thing you want to do is to get pre-approval, get pre-approval for a loan. And that way, you know exactly how much you are eligible for. A lot of times we focus on the score. The score just says that you are in position to borrow money, but it does not reflect how much money you can borrow. And I think that's where we uh, sometimes find uh, a gap. You know, people like, well, OK, I've got this credit score, but they don't realize that your uh, payment history, your debt to income ratio, all of those things impact that score. But it also impacts the amount of money that you are eligible to borrow. And so once you've done that, get you get the uh, pre-approval. And the reason why that's so important is mm -hmm. it's not fair to you, the buyer, to go out and look for a home that may cost $150,000 and you're only eligible for a hundred. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like taking a kid to the candy store <laughs> and then telling them he can't have the candy. However, you may be eligible for a lot more than you realize and you may be eligible for $100,000 more than you thought about. And so it just gives you a clear picture of the direction that you're going, then your realtor can seek out homes within your buying range. That okay. person 
is working for your best interest. And a lot of times sellers are saying that they only want people to come and visit their homes that have been pre-approved. They don't want to open their doors to people that are just, you know, just looking, but they, they really want serious buyers. And so one way to uh, determine that that person may be serious is that many times they'll say we realtors within our notes, we're told they must have pre-approval in order to come and view this home. And so that's the start of the process. So now I'm, I'm glad you just said that about the pre-approval because that, that is a very important part. I did not re recognize that homeowners can actually um, say that to, I guess it would be their agent to, to, ask on their behalf that people aren't able to see or how how is that how can well, you tell when, or can when you... the prop when the property is listed they have mm -hmm. what they call agent notes and okay. within the no agent notes it's pretty pretty common more times than not um uh, homeowners want to know that you have been pre-approved yeah. you're pre-approved and it's up to the agent to only show their home to people that have the capacity to purchase it. Awesome. And see, that's, that's a safeguard. Um, and this is this, but this is a safeguard for the homeowner who is, who is trying to sell, but then, so the agent notes are things that are only accessible to you all as real estate agents, correct? Correct. Okay, so like Zillow and um, and Realtor wouldn't showcase those. Well, things. sometimes they will tell you that, oh, okay. but like I said, it's it's pretty much the norm, more so than the exception. Okay, and so when we we think about pre approval, we're we're prepared. Um, you've been pre approved, which is a different process from actually pursuing a loan product. But if you're if you say if you're pre-approved for two hundred thousand, well, let's just say a hundred thousand. Let's go to the same the same numeric example that you you just spoke about. A hundred thousand dollars, you're pre-approved. Um, what kind of like how do you know what kind of loan to select from? Like what kind? What are the most common types of loan products that people um, may encounter as they as they try to become homeowners as they move out into that space that's that's a great question there are several different types of uh, loans and and a lot of times they are determined based on your credit score of course the higher your credit score the the more options you have and the better your interest rate will be okay. and so that's so critical but for instance a conventional loan uh your credit score range needs to be around 620 and you need to have 3% down. Whereas with the FHA, the credit score requirement is not as high, um, around 580, but you may be required to pay 3.5%. However, there are different loans depending on your location. Uh, USDA loans, which are in your rural communities, uh, your credit score range is right at six. 620 but the beauty of that is that it's uh no down payment but that that is determined by the location of the property that you are uh looking to purchase and then you have va loans which um you have uh around a 500 plus credit score and uh you have to of course be a veteran in order to qualify that, uh, for that. And so there are a lot of varieties uh, of loans that are available. When you contact your lender, they will definitely let you know which one best suits your situation. But uh, with all of them, that credit score is the critical thing. And so I encourage you, be familiar with your credit score. Make sure that you keep track of what's going on. If there's something on there that may, may need to be challenged, you can do that. Stay away as much as possible from co-signing uh, for other people because when you co-sign, it is reported on your credit score and it's counted mm -hmm. as part of, you know. And so, because when you co-sign, what you're saying is, if this person does, will, does not pay, then I will pay. And so I discourage anyone unless they can 
really, really avoid it. I can understand if you're a parent that's trying to help a child that's different. And, you know, that's another whole conversation because <laughs> we as parents, we can work towards helping to build our children's um, credit score even before they get started. But that's another whole conversation. But uh, just know that when you do uh, co-sign, that is part of a debt that is considered yours. You know, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, we, we've had uh, one other person talk about that co-signing thing, and she strongly um, said, you know, lets folks know that that's not something that should be done because of the very thing that you said. A lot of folks, you know, will attach it to, oh, well, you're not my friend or connected to, to you know, try to, I guess, kind of guilt people right. into right. <laughs> doing it but it literally is you signing a contract to say that if this person does not pay their bill or if for some reason something happens god forbid something happens to that person this now becomes your debt and it sits it rests in your debt to income ratio which could really impact especially if you're now in this process that you're describing of wanting to become a homeowner right it could literally, you know, put the kibosh. It could stop that process in its tracks. Um, simply, you know, because you know, with good intention, we're trying to help folks, but you know, actually ending up harming ourselves. So this is why programs like Wealth Building Wednesday exist, so that we can help equip people with the information, so that we're able to share this information. This is free information. This is free game, if you will. Right. So if you didn't understand the importance of not co-signing, if you didn't understand the importance of maintaining a good spending plan or maintaining a budget, saving. Dr. Chestnut, talk to us about saving the importance of no matter how little you think it is. It actually is a lot because you're starting. You are starting good habits when you start to save. Um so I wanted to just ask really quickly, I know that you are um, a real estate agent and that you are um, serving the entire river region. Wanted to ask really quickly, though, because as interest rates start to go up, there's this R word floating around of recession um, and the impact that this could potentially have on people being able to enter the housing market. Are you seeing that at all impact um, our area or is that something that maybe we might be able to to skate past? Um, well, of course, the you know, the interest rates, interest rates are much higher than they were when we uh, during the time of COVID. And that was yeah. to kind of jumpstart the economy to mm-hmm. encourage people to purchase uh, the interest rates now have gone up. Uh, if you're interested in making a purchase, you definitely want to go on and purchase just in case uh, we do run into a recession and rates may go even higher. However, you do want to make sure that you have a secure job that won't be impacted by uh, the recession. And so, you know, at this point, you you really just don't know, you know, however, um, having a continuous income, having a good credit score, because even if the rates are higher, when the rates go down, you can refinance at a lower interest rate. And so, you know, of course, having higher interest rate, it decreases the amount of money that you're eligible to borrow. But at the same time, we have no idea whether they're going to go higher than they are right now. And now if we have fixed because um, fixed and variable rates, um, and this is another whole conversation, conversation. but but 30 years is a typical mortgage um, loan. Mm -hmm. So if we are entering into um, a, a mortgage, is the expectation that all mortgages are are fixed or are all of them variable or is there room for negotiation? And that's going to be my last question. Look, (laughs) You choose the uh, terms of your loan with your lender. You term, you choose the terms, you know, of course, having a fixed uh, rate is 
somewhat advantageous because you have an idea of what your mortgage payment is going to be. You know, we had a big drop with the balloon payments and, and mm -hmm. the variable uh, notes because they may come back with an amount that you can't afford. And so uh, for the most part, most people will choose the fixed option. But even with the fix, there is nothing wrong with uh, paying additional uh, money towards your loan and apply it to principal only. Okay. Great information as always, Dr. Chestnut. Thank you so very much for being here with us for Wealth Building Wednesday. This will not be your last visit to the show. You are such a wealth of information that, yeah, we just, we can't just stop at one, just like a potato chip. We got to have you back. Uh <laughs> So thank you so much for taking time out. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I, I look forward to sharing. It's it's always just a blessing when you see people's dreams come true. And uh, of course, purchasing a home is one of uh, our dreams in life. And so uh, if there's anyone out there that wants to uh, look at purchasing a home, by all means, reach out to the dream maker. That's my uh uh, tag uh, tc.re.dreammaker at gmail.com but um, that's my mission to help those people that uh, are desiring, desiring to uh, purchase a home or even desiring to sell a home and so I just want to reinforce what she said if you are getting ready to if you are at or you are in the process, honey, you've downloaded Zillow, you've downloaded Realtor, and you are just wanting to see where you stand. This is a great opportunity right now um, to reach out. Her email address is tc.re.dreammaker. Y'all heard it. Dreammaker. D-R-E-A-M-M-A-K-E. Are. So if owning your home, owning a home is your dream, reach out to Dr. Chestnut, tc.re.dreammaker at gmail.com. That is her email address. It is posted in the comments. So listen, you can stop those comments. You can copy it and go right on over to your email and make sure that you reach out to her because this is this is the time for all of us to make our dreams come true. Real estate and land acquisition, those are keys to developing and building generational wealth. So we've got to listen, let's make, let's make our dreams come true. And let's start um, by, by picking up our phones because now we're emailing on our phones. Email Dr. Chestnut at tc.re.dreammaker at gmail. Dot com. So again, thank you so very much for being here with us. We look forward to having you back. And for you who are tuning in live, thank you so very much. Y'all, if this is not your journey, if this is not the information for you, that does not stop you from sharing this information with somebody else. So click that little share button and make sure that someone on your timeline Someone connected to you gets that start on achieving the dream of being a home or land owner. Until next Wednesday, y'all, let's get out here. We got to go house shopping. It's time to build some wealth. <laughs> See y'all next Wednesday.